Nuclear weapons haven't been used in warfare for three quarters of a century. I mean, think of how these norms took hold. These are not natural accomplishments. They're extraordinary accomplishments. That's the voice of Michael Crapon, co-founder and now distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. He and Lovely Umayam, founder of Bombshell Toe, are today's guests on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Before we get into the show, we have a special invitation for you. Yes, indeed, Michelle. Plowshares is holding its annual nuclear policy forum this week, where we take our first look at what to expect from the incoming Biden-Harris administration. This has always been an in-person event held in Washington, but thanks to the pandemic, this year we are virtual, so you can join us for free from the comfort of your own home. That's right. This Wednesday, November 18th, we'll be live from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern via Zoom. Join us to talk about the most pressing nuclear obstacles and opportunities facing the new president. We have a really great lineup, including Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey and Representative Adam Smith, chair of the House Armed Services Committee, and Pramila Jayapal, who is co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. We are also holding fantastic panels on what to expect on nuclear policy from the new administration and how we might reallocate hundreds of billions of dollars of excess nuclear spending to tackle the pandemic, climate change, and racial injustice. You can RSVP for this awesome event at plowshares.org. We really hope you are able to join us. Remember, it's this Wednesday, November 18th from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern. But with that, Back to today's episode. Tom, what do you have lined up for us on Early Warning? Uh, Michelle, we have a great episode today. Steve Pfeiffer from Stanford University is with us, taking a look at the two-person rule for launching nuclear weapons and why it doesn't apply to the most important person in the chain of command, uh, the President of the United States. And we'll look at how we can change that policy in a Biden administration. After that, we do something a little different with our main interview. I sat down with nuclear experts Michael Crepon and Lovely Umayam to take stock of the larger picture of where the nuclear field is right now. We had a cross-generational discussion on the most important trends and accomplishments in nuclear policy over the last 75 years, as well as, I think, a pretty frank appraisal of how far we still have to go. It's a conversation you won't want to miss. And finally, I answer a question about cyber threats to nuclear weapons on this week's Q&A. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. We'd love to hear from you. As always, please click the subscribe button and give us a rating. Ratings are your way of telling us how we're doing and we rely on them to make the show better. Let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thank you, Dell, for that introduction. Steve Pfeiffer is our guest today. Very excited to have him here. He is a William J. Perry Fellow at Stanford's Freeman Spoley Institute for International Studies. He's a retired Foreign Service officer and served more than 25 years in the State Department, focused on U.S. relations with the former Soviet Union and Europe. Steve, it's great to have you here. Tom, great to be with you. Um, As Press the Button listeners know well, President Trump has sole authority to launch the U.S. nuclear arsenal. And this issue has gained more attention since Trump came down with COVID last month. Uh, And now that he appears to be in a dark post-election mood. Even my mom called me last week, worried that Trump might start nuclear war before he leaves office. So I think this is on people's minds. Um, 
Now, the fact that Trump could start nuclear war does not mean that he will, uh, but it'll be sure nice if this wasn't one more issue that we had to worry about. Uh, and Steve, uh, I think you're worried about it too. You wrote a great article published last week in Defense One about your professional experiences with nuclear weapons um, and what is known as the two-man or two-person rule, right. um, which, which is typically used to prevent the misuse, mislaunch of nuclear weapons. Can, can you tell us more about that? Yeah. I mean, the military as a rule applies what they call the two-man rule. You could say also two-person rule, which basically means that whenever you're handling nuclear weapons or there's an order, there basically have to be two people to confirm it. So, for example, in the launch control cells for intercontinental ballistic missiles, there are two officers they independently have to verify a valid launch order and then do things to launch the missile. And then there actually have to be officers in a separate launch control cell to validate that decision. Um, the several times during my career when I was near nuclear weapons, there were always at least two people nearby, sometimes with weapons, and because the military takes great care about these things. Um, and if you make a mistake in the military, it can be career ending. Uh, there was a story about 12 years ago where a B-52 bomber flew from North Dakota to Louisiana carrying what they thought were six unarmed cruise missiles. And it turned out those cruise missiles actually had live nuclear warheads. That provoked a huge investigation. And when the dust settled, the chief of staff of the Air Force was gone, the secretary of the Air Force was gone, and a lot of people were removed from their jobs. But that two-person rule applies or does not apply only at one level, and that's the president of the United States who has commander and commander chief as sole authority, uh, the president does not need to get concurrence from anyone, does not need even to consult anyone. That president has that authority. And I think it's time to reconsider that. Uh, thanks for that. And, and, and I think we'll all relax a bit when President Trump hands the football to President Biden in January. But of course, as you point out in your article, uh, Trump could run again and we could have another Trumpian president in our future. Uh, what would you say that a Biden administration could do to lower this risk? Well, the Biden administration, I think, could work with Congress on this. And I guess I would separate the issue out. I mean, if there is first use of nuclear weapons against the United States or against an American ally, then you know, it's reasonable to let the president have the sole voice. But the question really comes up if there's going to be first use by the United States of nuclear weapons. And many people I don't think realize that is that current U.S. policy does envisage that possibility that the United States might, for example, in a conventional conflict that's going badly, use nuclear weapons first. I personally think that would be a bad idea that that would not be in the U.S. security interest. But what I would suggest is that if there's going to be that situation, the president has to get somebody else to concur. Now, it could be Congress, although I think Congress would be a cumbersome mechanism. So what I suggested is that there be a second designated individual. That person should not be a military officer because, of course, they're going to respond to the president's order. Should probably not be a cabinet official. You might consider the vice president, but it's probably better to look to other branches. So what I suggest would be the Speaker of the House, perhaps the, um, uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader or the Chief Justice of the, of the Supreme Court. And there would be a requirement that if the president was considering first use of nuclear weapons, the president would have to consult with that designated second individual and get that person's concurrence. Uh, and, and that would, I think, guard against some of the situations that we've worried about in the last couple of months where a president who's on medication with very heavy side effects might make a decision uh, that uh, you know, we would all come to regret. And now uh, I think you're, you're, that's probably uh, assumed in what you're saying, but it's important that, that second person not be fireable um, by exactly. the president in the same way that, you know, uh, President Trump fired uh, Secretary of Defense Esper uh, by tweet just the other day. And that's the kind of situation, obviously, you don't want in this situation. Um, exactly. as, and that's why I think there would be value in going to a second individual who would be outside the executive branch. Got it. Got it. Um, now, as, as, as you just pointed out, um, we're really talking about sole authority for first use. And so another approach to ending sole authority is to prohibit first use. Um, and now, of course, we have President-elect Biden, who's proposed something similar, uh, a sole purpose policy. In other words, it would be the sole purpose of, U of U.S. nuclear weapons to deter their use by others. 
Uh, how do these policies compare in your view? Yeah, I think there's a small but still significant difference. Uh, the way I read no first use is it would say, under no circumstances would the United States ever use nuclear weapons first. Uh, uh, and I prefer sole purpose, where you would say that the purpose of American nuclear weapons is to deter a nuclear attack on the United States or on an American ally, and then to respond should there be that nuclear attack. And, and what I think sole purpose does is it gives you just a tiny bit of wiggle room. And that is, there's only one circumstance that I could see where a president really would seriously consider first use of nuclear weapons. And that is if there was absolutely compelling evidence that a nuclear armed adversary was preparing to strike the United States or an American ally with nuclear weapons. And the only way to forestall that would be American first use. I mean, to, to, to my mind, in that case, nuclear deterrence has failed. <laughs> and so I think it's a bit different from no first use. And um, I, I, as a general rule, I, I, it makes sense for America's declaratory policy, in fact, to align with its actually what it would really do. So I would prefer the sole purpose policy over no first use. And just a question on that. So, I mean, in that case, you would have some intelligence that is so compelling that the president would feel confident to launch a first strike on the assumption that there's a first strike coming here. Now, would you do you think a president would ever be so convinced by the intelligence to have that confidence? Yeah, I, I mean, that that's uh, a good question. What is absolutely compelling evidence? And again, uh, this is the sort of thing where th this really would have to be a near certainty in the mind of the president. I I'm not sure in advance you can define what that is. It'll be one of the things that you would see it when you know it. Uh, but again, it, and if there was any doubt, you know, my own bias would be, you know, not to launch first. I mean, what you don't want to do in a situation where there's a crisis is, in fact, launch a nuclear attack when the other side was not planning one, and you, in fact, trigger the nuclear war. And again, when I look at U.S. Amer security interests, it's very difficult for me to see any case in which use of nuclear weapons is going to be good for those security interests. Thank you for that. Um, last question, and then we'll let you go. What prospects do you see for sole purpose or no first use in a Biden administration? Yeah, well, it was interesting. Uh, apparently, during the uh, Obama-Biden administration back in 2009 and 2010, when they were preparing the Obama administration's nuclear posture view, my, my understanding is that, that they cast aside no first use fairly early on. Uh, and while they were not prepared at, in 2010 to adopt sole purpose, uh, the posture view did say that the goal of American policy was to get to a point where sole purpose would be the guiding principle for US nuclear weapons. And basically they were talking about developing some additional conventional capabilities so that there would be no circumstances in which the United States would have to use nuclear weapons except in the case of a nuclear attack. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, in one of his last public uh, appearances as vice president, um, a president like Biden in January of 2017 talked about this and said he actually personally favored sole purpose. Uh, and the Democratic Party platform that was approved this summer also includes the phrase the Democrats believe that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons should be to deter a nuclear attack or to respond if there is a nuclear attack. Uh, so there may be um, there's a suggestion there that the president elect might, in fact, favor this. It's something I think the administration is going to have to consider. You don't adopt it overnight. You want to consult with allies on this. Uh, but I believe in this case, the president elect's instincts are right. Steve, thank you so much. We are out of time. I have a feeling these issues are going to stay with us. Uh, but thanks again for your time. OK, Tom, thanks for having me. Today, we're going to do something a little different. I'm joined by Michael Crepon and lovely Amayam to take stock of where we, the nuclear field, are right now. Michael is the co-founder and now a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center, where he was president and CEO until 2000. He is the author and editor of 22 books and previously worked at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the State Department's Arms Control and Disarmament Agency during the Carter administration and on Capitol Hill. Michael, I'm so glad you were able to join us. Thanks for asking, Michelle. 
We're also joined by Lovely Umayam, who is the founder of Bombshell Toe, a creative hub linking artists, community organizers, and nuclear experts together to present nuclear policy in a compelling and impactful way to the greater public. Previously, she managed the nuclear security portfolio at the Stimson Center and served in the National Nuclear Security Administration doing nuclear safeguards outreach. Lovely, thank you for calling in from the West Coast. Well, thank you for having me. It's so great to be with all of you today. So today we find ourselves at a crossroads. Arms control agreements are in tatters. Nations are modernizing their nuclear arsenals and we are still awaiting final outcomes in a US presidential election that will determine in many ways, I think, what is possible for future nuclear policy. And I know that the three of us see these possibilities and challenges through different lenses. So today we're going to discuss what we think the nuclear field should be doing to respond. And we've each brought questions to ask the other two guests. So that actually leads to the question I had for both of you about how we've seen a lot of critiques in the last year or so about what we call the nuclear field in which I think of as the collection of, of NGOs, um, of labs, of those who work in government who are really focused on reducing nuclear risks. Um, these critiques include that the field is too small, too fractured, too white, too elite, too male, too consumed by Cold War problems and only offering Cold War answers. How would you respond? Well, guilty is charged. But do we have a statute of limitations? Because my sense is that people working in the field, um, it's way different than um, in my earlier decades working on arms control and disarmament. Uh, You two are perfect examples, but there are so many others. Uh, uh, You know, the energy, the creativity, uh, a lot of impulses are coming from women in politics at large, in political campaigns, on Capitol Hill, and in this field. We still have a way to go, but it's stunning to me how far we've gone. And Michelle, I want to add, it's important as we recognize our flaws, our limitations, uh, our biases, it's important to recognize how much we've accomplished. Um, And Nuclear weapons haven't been used in warfare for three quarters of a century. Uh, Nuclear weapons have been stigmatized so much that they haven't even been tested for over two decades. Um, We have one outlier and nobody wants to join North Korea's club. I mean, think of how these norms took hold These are not natural accomplishments. They're extraordinary accomplishments. And so as we are aware of how much we need to improve as a community, I would like us to also recognize how much we've accomplished. Well, the genesis of our field, at least speaking for the United States, Um, Of course, there's no denying that its foundations are old white men because the cultures and systems of power bestowed them the keys of information and agency at that time. Um, So I'm not surprised that this is the bedrock of the field. But to add to what Michael said, um, there's a learning curve for everything, including the development of these kinds of fields. And I think what we can be better about is the pace of adapting to reflect the conditions of today. Um, Just because the foundations of the field only acknowledge a specific group of people 
as its founders, um, I'm beginning to, to realize through my journey um, as a policy expert and as a creative that the, the, that does not entitle them to be purveyors of all knowledge and of memories. And that's because they were not the only people who existed and affected by the advent of the bomb. And I think that the, the word that comes to mind is defiance. You know, how can we continue to remind the field that at its most fundamental level, this thing that we study, which is the horrors and wonders of the atom is for everybody. You know, it's not a narrative that can be owned by a specific group of people, the government, military, academia, or white people. It is universal. And I think the, to go back to this point about progress, right? Um, there's this really interesting tension there, right? In order to embrace and acknowledge progress, you need defiance and you need to continue to push um, for that kind of progress. You can't have one without the other. And I feel like um, as a field, we need to appreciate both sides, um, not so much as just despair about how things are slow, um, but also understand how far we've come. One of the things that stuns me about you, Lovely, is, is your duality. So there's this amazing creative side to you. And there's also, you know, this nuts and bolts side to you. So I guess I'm interested in how you balance the two. <laughs> uh, that's a really difficult question because I think it's, it's a journey. Um, I, I'm still trying to figure out how to balance it. Um, but I am beginning to appreciate how both reinforce it. I think that the nuts and bolts policy expert part of me is stronger because of my willingness and my receptivity to unique creative ways of thinking. And then my creativity, I think, gets a lot of rigor in the types of research and analysis that I've conducted over the years. I think one of the things that also has been inspiring is to see how the nuclear policy field in and of itself has been receptive to these types of dualities. I think that I have peers, including Michelle, um, and as well as you, Michael, um, and others that want to see this kind of thinking more and more. Um, I'm definitely seeing that in the next generation of policy practitioners, even younger than me, um, and how they're doing it and incorporating their culture that I may not necessarily understand, incorporating technologies that I'm not well versed in. Um, and so I think that this duality that I have, although I think I'm blessed with it and uh, I'm still continuing to learn from it, I, I want to see a field in the future where that is the baseline because I think that that's how we grow as a community. To that point, I am curious whether, or rather, how can we balance the emotions dominant in our field, the anger and hope in communicating nuclear policy work to the greater public? So I'm always struck by the level of secrecy in this field, the amount that goes unsaid and the disinfectant nature of sunshine. And I think when mm. I think about balancing anger and hope, I think of starting at a place of speaking truth. And this goes for, you know, Michael, what you were talking about of the, the truths of the accomplishments that we have achieved thus far and lovely to the truths that you were speaking of how the field itself was formed. And I think by focusing on getting, and I know there's, <laughs> I know there's all sorts of debates on, you know, how, how facts don't interest people, but I think there's a story 
of the facts and the story of those truths that you put forward. And that is how you balance the anger and the hope. I think the, I think my experience in working on nuclear issues is, you know, this obsession with putting forward these facts about treaties, about how many weapons are out there, about, um, Mm -hmm. you know, what these safeguards agreements will do for these, you know, uh, very technical purposes. And it leaves out the emotions that go with it. And I think that's where we run into trouble. I think we need to speak these truths, but let them remain connected to the emotions that come from them and then engage those emotions as a part of it. So you just actually made me uh, remember this uh, interview that I was just listening to. Um, So I was listening to Yuval Noah Harari, who is the author of Sapiens. Um, And in this interview, he said something to the effect of that he's attended so many conferences that talk about these facts, right? Economics, policies. Um, But oftentimes these granular conversations lose sight of what it means to live and to understand life, right? Connecting it to the larger questions um, and the emotions. It's all expertise and not a lot of insight. And I think Mm. that really resonated with me because I think all fields, not just our nuclear policy community, should be better about contemplating and not just being about an expert and being the loudest or most famous. Um, And to me, emotions matter. And I, I haven't figured this all out, but again, hope and anger are necessary dualities because what I'm most interested in is understanding how different emotions interplay with each other to get to what I think at the moment is really the goal, which is responsibility, right? How can we engender these emotions to get people to understand that the atom or nuclear issues shouldn't necessarily be championed exclusively or feared exclusively, but treated with respect and responsibility. Um, And that's why I, I, I think we, we need to have these conversations alongside what we talk about in sort of our expert circles, which are about the numbers and the theories and the treaties. Um, we, we can't leave um, emotion and communication out. Um, can I ask another question related to, to this? I think, what does it mean for the nuclear security field to collaborate with other fields and disciplines? Well, if it's just us, we're going to lose. But if it's us and other issues that we care about together, we can win. If it's just political science or numerology, we're going to lose. It has to be, as you say, lovely, sociology, anthropology, history, in all the other disciplines. I think, and Michelle, I totally agree with you that while the numbers are important, the stories are, are really more important and more affecting. And the story, to my way of thinking, that is largely missing from nuclear arms control and key junctures and key crises and moments when things could have gone sideways so quickly. What's missing is the aspect of our common humanity. And that's not political science. (laughs) It's not just sociology or anthropology or history. It's our common humanity. And our common, our humanity involves rationality. It also involves feeling. And at, at critical junctures, when we were facing the abyss, somebody, and it wasn't just the president, it could have been somebody way down 
in the chain of command so far down that they're not on the organization chart. But somebody remembered our common humanity. And our common humanity trumped, pardon the use of the word, our common humanity trumped the nuclear war fighting calculations, the comparative advantage or disadvantage. It was our common humanity that has come to the rescue over and over and over again. We do not go there. We don't cross the nuclear threshold. Because once we cross the nuclear threshold, all of our mental gymnastics and calculations are meaningless. If we cross the nuclear threshold, we have killed deterrence. And if we kill deterrence, we also kill countless human beings. I I think however the election comes out, what we know for absolute certainty is that we are so deeply divided as a country. And for our issues, to me, this suggests stepping back and trying to engage in the useful conversations you're talking about. And you don't engage in them if you come in with the answer. I think we have to start all over again with first principles, discussions, respectful discussions about first principles. Because deterrence strengtheners tend to think that safety comes with having unfettered uh, arms making. And you stay ahead. You seek security by staying ahead. And our community sees it totally different. Uh, We see dangers in that course because deterrence without arms control is really dangerous. Deterrence is supposed to be dangerous. Um, But we also know that deterrence breaks down. So let's talk together. Let's reason together if we can. Um, How do we seek safety uh, in a world of danger? And not just our danger, uh, but our danger overlaps with other people's danger. Certainly overlaps with environmental danger. Uh, public health dangers. I'm sort of on that wavelength as well. Returning to first principles have been really comforting this year, Um, especially with the pandemic. One of the struggles, and perhaps others in the field may feel this way, it's very difficult to hold um, and completely care about, you know, an imagined nuclear catastrophe in the future when we are all sort of struggling to survive a pathogenic crisis. Um, It's very difficult to juggle multiple existential crises. But what has been illuminating is returning to questions about what is security? What does it mean to secure each other and oneself um, and seeing how that manifests in sort of our day-to-day living as we're all sort of still in isolation and um, grappling with the uncertainty of the election and what does it mean to secure um, democracy and a sense of freedom. All of it is tied to one another. And I think in some ways this year, as difficult as it has been, gives us the opportunity to pause and think about that through line. I think that question about what makes us safe, clearly that's the 
debate we need to have. Um, and Michael, you know, as you're talking about it, it's, that's the conversation we need to have at, at minimum here in the United States um, among various groups of people. Cause I think there's different concepts of it and, and it's so exhausting to live in fear. <laughs> No, no. I mean, I, like having lived all over the United States and seeing how people think about security differently, it is exhausting to think to to always be on your guard. And I think that is where we need to push um, to really come to that set of shared principles, which is then expressed in how we spend public resources, what our defense looks like. Um, and, and in some ways, right, we'll <laughs> cart before horse, we will be, you know, part of that debate will be through things like the budget fights in Congress, but um, budgets are not about numbers. They're about values. So I, I think that's where, where we'll need to see the work. So we're just about at the end of our time, but I had one last question um, in part prompted by uh, Michael, your point about how far we've come. What is the biggest change you've seen each seen over the course of your careers? It has positive and negative aspects, but the most important change for me has been the establishment of what I call the nuclear peace. Now, clearly the world is not very peaceful and there are all kinds of brush fire wars and border wars and crises. But it's astounding to me that we have gotten used to there, the notion that mushroom clouds do not belong on our earth and that we ought to stigmatize these weapons so much. Whether or not a treaty has entered into force, folks are not supposed to test these weapons. Yeah. Now, when I entered the field, none of this was a given. Uh, and for people in previous generations, there was the expectation that, that atomic bombs would be used. It wasn't a question of whether, it was a question of when. And there were tests you know, every other Thursday and nuclear tests were atmospheric for crying out loud, as well as underground. Uh, this change has occurred in my lifetime, and I'm so grateful for it. Now, be, we can't become complacent about it. That's the downside. Uh, we have to keep fighting for the extension of these norms every single day every crisis, but it's a huge shift in my 79 years. In terms of what I've seen, I think I've been most struck by what is considered legitimate conversation. Um, when I started, you know, bringing up racism or sexism, was like not something you did. And maybe it's age, right? Maybe it was just the circles I ran in or the, the people I talked to, but I think there's been a change of what's considered taboo. And in terms of nuclear, I think, you know, I, you couldn't really, even though President Obama was for the elimination of nuclear weapons, it was hard to say disarmament and be taken seriously in many circles. And I feel like that's something that sure, people are, are they hotly debate, um, but maybe it's because those nuclear threats have just become 
in some ways more real. Um, it's, it's something that now you can put forward and discuss um, and are, are taken seriously on. So I, I, I just am struck by the shifting of, of what's legitimate and what's on the table. Hmm, that's awesome. Michael, lovely. I really appreciate you sitting down with me, um, especially in these chaotic times. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, this has been refreshing. Thank you. Curious about what a Biden administration will do on nuclear weapons policy and how Congress might respond? Join Senators Elizabeth Warren, Ed Markey, Representatives Adam Smith, Pramila Jayapal, and others for a discussion on transforming national security, nuclear policy for a new era. This special Plowshares Fund policy briefing will broadcast live via Zoom this Wednesday, November 18, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Additional panelists include Dr. Nahid Bedelia of Boston Medical Center and Julian Brave of NoiseCat, among others. These experts will discuss how hundreds of billions of dollars in excessive nuclear spending could fund higher national priorities, such as responses to the coronavirus, racial injustice, and climate change. To register for this Wednesday's free event, visit plowshares.org. everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A segment. This week's question comes from Catherine in North Carolina and will be answered by Tom. Tom, are you ready for this? Bring it on, Michelle. Catherine asks, we know about cyber threats to our electoral system, but can you talk about cyber threats to our nuclear system? Great question, Catherine. Uh, And yes, not only do people know about cyber threats to the electoral system, but they also know about cyber threats to their computer system. It's something that everyone, practically everyone has to deal with. Um, And yet few people realize that our nuclear command and control system and early warning systems uh, are, are of course, based on computers uh, and they're networked together. So our command and control systems and our early warning systems are indeed vulnerable Um, to cyber hacks. And the scenario that really worries me uh, is imagine that an adversary hikes into our early warning system and sends signals uh, and spoofs the system into thinking that there's a nuclear attack coming from Russia or from somewhere else um, with, say, hundreds of nuclear weapons. And this information, uh, if deemed credible, would be uh, communicated to the president of the United States, who, of course, has sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. And once they got that alarm, even though it's a false alarm, uh, they would know it's false and they would have just minutes to decide whether to launch U.S. nuclear weapons uh, before that attack arrives or to wait. Uh, So this is a tremendously dangerous situation. Unfortunately, we can't really solve the situation by addressing cyber hacks directly uh, because, you know, people in the biz tend to recognize that the uh, the offense when it comes to cyber hacks tends to stay ahead of the defense. In other words, we could mount defenses on cyber attacks, but the offense is always going to be one step ahead. So to me, the only way we can solve this threat of cyber attack to our nuclear command and control uh, is through policy. And so we have to change the policies that we have uh, when it comes to use policy on nuclear weapons. And and first and foremost, uh, we have to assume that if if there's an alert, that that alert is likely a false alarm. Uh, And that's because of the cyber threat. It's also because, you know, if there's an attack presumably coming from Russia, Uh, That makes no sense, right? The Russians know full well that if they attack the United States with nuclear weapons, they will be obliterated in response. Um, So to me, the primary threat we face is not an intentional attack from Russia. 
uh, but it's blundering into nuclear war as a result of something like um, a cyber attack that causes a false alarm. And we need to deal with this um, not by cyber fixes, but by policy fixes, uh, by taking sole authority away from the president, uh, by prohibiting the first use of nuclear weapons, and by retiring the weapons that are most vulnerable um, to a false alarm and to a mistaken uh, retaliation, which is our land-based ballistic missiles. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. And thank you, Catherine. And remember, if you would like to get your question on the air, tweet or DM us at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.